Introduction to Linux Part 2. In this video we're going to continue our introduction to Linux and we'll talk about the man pages and the info pages and they're just like an online manual. It's a great reference resource, it's a great way to learn, it's a great way to go back if you forget something and just uh, get that little piece of information quickly off the, off the computer. You don't even have to leave your computer, you can just do it right, right in front of you. Um, and then we'll talk about the directory structure of Linux, sort of like how things are organized and then I'll just give you some other tidbits to make your life on a Linux system a little easier. All right, so let's get started and we'll look at the man pages and the info pages. There's a few ways to get information about commands in Linux and the options for those commands and the various uh, configuration files and what they control. And two of the most popular ways are the man pages and the info pages. In some sense, the info pages are a newer version of the man pages, but really it's just like the info pages are just organized differently. Okay. Uh, occasionally you will see a man page though that says uh, this man page is no longer being maintained, refer to the info page and then obviously in that case you should refer to the info page for that. But really like I said they're just organized, it's the same information organized differently and they both have their use so let's look at both of them. Alright so first we'll look at the man page for something. So the way that you look at the man page for some command you say man you follow that by a space and then you give the command that you want to uh, get the man page for. Okay, and man here just stands for manual, right? So, so we take the man, we do a man page on ls, and I hit enter, and now I'm in the man page for ls, and and it has like a, a little header here that says what the name of the command is, a brief you know explanation of the command, and then there's like a synopsis here that says you know how do you use the command? You put the options first, and then you put the file or directory that you're going to list second. All right, but it also to look down here, it says list information about the files, the current directory by default. So if I don't specify a file or a directory to list here, then it's just going to list the contents of my current directory. All right, and, and that's the way we've done it so far, right? We've just done ls at the command line and it's listed the contents of our current directory. Now there's some options for ls down here. We see like the minus a option, minus capital A option, minus b option, and so on. And, and you know, these just go down the page here. We're only seeing the first page of, of this man page for ls and we'll page down in a second. Uh, first, let's talk about the minus A option here. This is a pretty useful option for LS. Um, alternatively, you could say minus minus all. You can see that there. This is a little bit more descriptive. Typically, I'll do these options, though, the short options. And when I pull out a new one for some command, I'll try and explain that to you, what it's for. If, if somehow I, I brush over that and I forget, then, you know, just pull up the man page for it and look at that option to see exactly what it does. You can see here from the description, it says, do not hide entries starting with a star. Okay, or starting with a period, sorry. So, so you might, if you're not familiar with Linux, you might say, well, you know, what files start with a period? A and, you know, the files that start with a period typically are user configuration files in your home directory. Okay, so if, when we get out of the screen here, we'll do an ls minus a and you can see uh, all those files that start with a period. And, you know, they're user config files for various things, for your Windows stuff, for your, you know, your bash shell and things. And, and really, um, you know, what they are is there are files that you don't really want to see all the time that's why they're typically hidden but if you do want to see them you have to give the minus a option to ls you, you want to know where user configuration files are but you want, don't want them to get in the way all the time okay so so there's our first page of the ls man page to see the m more of this you just hit spacebar okay and I'm and I'm paging down if I want to go back up I hit the B key and now you can see I'm going back up I'll hit the spacebar then I'll go down a little bit and let's look at one more option here the minus L option and that for, for that option we get a long listing so what that means is we get all sorts of information about the files and the directories that, that we're listing like uh, the last modification date the size um, the owner and, and various things like that and again we'll do an LS minus L when we get out of the screen Okay, so that's that's what the man page looks like. All the various options are out here. If we keep paging down, you'll see there's just tons and tons of options for LS. Okay, uh, you can see the authors down here. If you have bugs to, that you want to report, that's where you go. Uh, there's like a little copyright, and and you know here's the full documentation for LS is maintained as a tech info manual. The info and LS programs are properly installed at your site. Info LS. Okay, and so you know they're saying right here that the full documentation is, is, a, is as an info page. So let's do the info page for this and we'll see how that differs as well. So I'll, I'll quit out of here with a Q and now I'm out of the man page. Um, let's do a couple ls commands first and then we'll go and look at the info page. 
So let's do the ls uh, command and we can see you know what files are in our directory. Then we'll do the ls minus a command and you'll see a whole bunch more files come up, right? I haven't changed directories. All those files up here, C and hold and Linux syllabus, they're all in here. There's C, there's hold, there's Linux syllabus, right? But but there's a whole bunch more files and all the ones, you know, other files all start with a period. Okay, and these are all user config files. They're preferences or they're, you know, like this one, the dot bash history. Remember when I showed you the history, how you could look at your previous commands by hitting the up arrow like this, right? Well, well, all those commands um, are, are stored in the dot bash history file. So that's what that's for. Uh, the dot gnome file. Actually, this is a directory full of configuration files for your gnome desktop environment. Okay, so uh, th that's what all these dot files are. They're either config files or directories full of configuration files for various for various things that are that are at the user level. These aren't system config files. These just control you know your personal configuration of the system. Okay, of of your experience on the system. All right, so that's the ls minus a command. Let's do an ls minus l command now, and then we'll see what that does. So ls minus l. Uh, now notice, like here, I did an ls, and it's got the c hold Linux syllabus mail scripts, and that's what's down here. C hold Linux syllabus mail scripts. Okay, so they're all listed down the side here, and each one's got a full row of information about it. Okay, over here, this says that it's a directory. These are the privileges of who can read and write it. Uh, these is the owners of the file. This is the size of the file, the last modification date, and so on. Okay, so you know that's that. Like I said, that's a lot of information in there, and we'll talk a lot more about all these permissions and ownership and stuff in like you know five or eight videos down the road. Okay, so so don't worry too much about that now. But but that's how you get the long listing, and you can always combine options. Like if I wanted to do you know a long listing of all these things, I could do um, ls minus al. Now that's going to be a lot of information that's going to scroll off the screen, but I'll hit enter anyway just so you can see. Again, we're just getting long listings of everything, including the dot files. All right, so that's the ls command. Now let's go ahead and look at the info page for ls. Now let's pull the info page up on a particular command. We might as well just do the ls command again so that we can compare and contrast info pages and man pages. So I'll hit enter here, and now I'm in the info page for the ls command. And you might see right off the bat here that there's a more of an English language description up front about what the command does, what the various options are, and what the options will do. Just, just an, a gen, like I said, general English language description of that. And that's nice for new users. It gives you more of a description, more of a feel of what the command does without having to get technical right away and start looking at all the various options. All right, and then you can hit spacebar to page down in an info page, just like a man page. You can also use the arrow keys to go up and down. And the, the thing that really differentiates info pages from man pages is this section at the bottom here with all these asterisks that start the line. And really wh what these are is these are like subcategories of the info page. So they're, they're separate pages of text and they're just classified by various categories. So let's highlight one of these. Let me move my cursor right over this one that says which files are listed. And I'll hit enter here. And now I go to a different page. It's a subsection called which files are listed. And basically every option in, these, in this section alters which files are listed by the ls command. You can see the minus a option is in there, and we already know what the minus a option for ls does. It lists the files that start with a period, and you know that alters which files are listed. So that's why it's in this section. Okay, so so just like every other option in this in this section, it will alter which files are listed. Now to go back a level, you hit the l key, and now you go back one level to where we were just before. Uh, let me highlight a different one here. Let's use the arrow key to go down one, and let's uh, highlight this one. What information is listed? And again, we'll hit enter, and now we go to the subsection. What information is listed? Again, we can page down with the space bar to see all the various options that alter the the information listed by ls, and you can see in here that the minus l option is in this section. And we know what it does. It, it displays more information than the plain old ls command. That's why it's in this section on what information is listed. N now that I've just thought about it, let me show you one more thing about the info page, what to do in the info page, and then we'll go and do this in the man page. Let me show you how to search through these documents. So if you hit control s in an info page, you get this thing down here that says I search. And basically, it's just waiting for you to type in some word, and then it's going to find that word for you in this page. So let me type the word long there. So I type the word long, and then it finds this instance of the word long. And that's the first instance of the word long after the placement of my cursor, which used to be right here. 
Then I hit control S again and I go to the next instance of the word long. I hit control S again, I go to the next instance and so on. Okay? And then when I want to stop searching, I just hit control G and then you can see I've quit the searching. And now I can just hit Q to quit out of the info page. All right? So that's how you search through an info page and that's actually just how you search through an Emacs document as well because the info page is really just an Emacs editor showing you that information. All right, so, so hitting control S searches through an info page or an Emacs document. Now let's look at a man page. Again, we'll just do LS and I'll show you how to search through this. So this is more like a VI window because it's got that colon down there and the way that you search through a man page is just like the way you search in a VI document. You hit the forward slash and you can see the colon down there turn to a forward slash. Then you type the word you're looking for, hit enter, and now it finds the first instance of that word. Okay, if you want to find the next instance, you hit the N key for next, and now you uh, see the next instance. Hit N again, you see the next one. And uh, if you hit N again, it says pattern not found, press return. I can press return, and I'm back to the colon, and I can just hit Q to quit out. So in summary here, the info pages I think are better for new users just because the information's organized a little bit better, it's more categorized into various sections. So if you're just browsing and trying to learn things, the info pages I think are more conducive to that. The man pages might be nicer for experienced users because all the information's, you know, just in like one window and you get to search through that window, you're searching through the entire man page for the command. Whereas when you search in an info page, maybe you're only searching on the particular page of some subcategory and you're not searching through the whole thing. So it just depends what you're doing. If you're trying to learn things, I think the info pages are better. And if you're an experienced user just trying to pinpoint one precise bit of information in the whole document, then maybe the man pages are better. I just remember this experience that I had like in 7th or 8th grade or something. I turned in this paper and, and it was in the days before word processors and spell checkers and I typed this paper out and, on like an old school typewriter, you know. And, uh, and you know, I turn the paper in and it's like a three page paper and the teacher finds like 20 spelling errors or something. And she writes at the bottom of the page, uh, you know, get a dictionary and look the words up. And I turned around to her and I said, well, how am I supposed to look the words up if I can't spell them? <laughs> so it, the dictionary is kind of like that for, for spelling, right? Like you can't just like look a word up to determine how to spell it because you have to know how to spell it to look it up. And obviously you can guess and stuff, but the man pages are kind of like that too. Maybe there's a command out there that does something that you want to do, but you don't know the name of it. So how you supposed to look up the manual page for it. So the way that you can do that uh, roughly is use the man minus K option. And what this does is, um, I'll just show you an example. I'll do man minus K JPG to find out commands that work on JPEG files for instance. Okay, that's like those picture files. All right, so uh, here's two commands that have JPG in the name of the command. Man minus K will find all the commands that have JPG either in the name or in the description of the command. Okay. Another way to do this that I usually remember more easily than man minus K is to say apropos. Okay. Here, let me do it JPEG this time to expand my search. Okay. And now you'll see I found a few more hits here. Okay. So here's all the commands on the system that either have JPEG in the name of the command or in the description of the command. Okay. Or both. All right. And this is just a very useful tool to, you know, to find new commands that you don't know the names to yet. Now when we get around to installing the system, you'll see a lot more about the super user account, but I just want to show it to you right now. Um, you know, typically for your normal operation on the system, you're just going to be some regular user like the Perry account here. But you know, when you need to do system administration tasks like, you know, install some new piece of software for everybody or add some new user account or something like that, you need to be a special user on the system called the super user. And if you're privileged, if you're really the administrator of the system, then you switch over to be the super user account by typing SU. And then what you do is you type in the password for the super user account, which I'll do now. And then if you're uh, privileged, what it's going to do is it's gonna, if you have the password right, you're going to get into that account. And you can see now I'm logged on as the root account. Okay, that's the name of the super user account. So now I can do things that I couldn't do when I was Perry. I have privileges to read all the different files and directories on the system and I can run certain programs that I couldn't run uh, when I was just the Perry account. Okay, so this is like the administrator's account uh, or, or the super user account it's called and, and this is what you're going to use to do those special things on the system. And like I said, we'll talk about this more when we uh, actually do the installation and then later on through the video series when we're talking about administration stuff, you know, we'll always have to switch over to be the root user to actually do these tasks. 
Now what I want to do is I just want to give you a quick little tour of the Linux directory structure. And we'll do this again later once we know a little bit more about Linux and we'll go into more detail then. But for right now I just want to show you a handful of things about how things are organized in, in, in the Linux system. So let's go up to the very top level directory and we do that by saying cd slash. Okay, and this will take us up to the very top level directory of the directory hierarchy here. And I do an ls there and you'll see a bunch of subdirectories. So, so now let's just talk about a couple things. Okay, so uh, these directories can, are supposed to contain certain things. And if you understand what they're supposed to contain, then when you go to look for something, you'll be able to find it more easily. If you need to put something new on your system, you'll know where to put it, you'll know where not to put it, that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's just talk about a handful of these. The bin directory holds binaries or executable programs. And if we go down into the bin directory uh, from, from this level directory here, we'll do an ls and you'll see a bunch of commands in here. And it's a bunch of commands, you know, a lot of the commands that we've already learned are in here. The cat command, uh, the ls command, the remove command, the pwd command, the vi command, they're all in the slash bin directory. So slash bin holds like the most common executed programs on the system. It holds, uh, you know, the stuff that normal users use on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so that's what's in the slash bin directory. Now let's go up a level, uh, back up and do an ls again. So we, so we talked about the bin directory. The boot directory holds stuff to boot your system. Home is where, uh, you know, the user's home directories are located. Uh, the op directory is where you install optional software. Uh, the root directory is actually the root user's home directory. So the root user here has their own home directory. It's not under slash home. It's under slash root, okay? Uh, and, and there's a little terminology conflict here because some people call the slash directory the root directory because they think of the directory structure as a tree, which it is, and, and, and you know, this is like the base of the tree, so, so that they call it the root. All right, but you know, this is some people also call this directory the slash root directory the root directory. So if somebody's talking about it or you're reading it in a book or something, just be careful and clarify exactly which one it is, whether it's the slash directory or the slash root directory that they're talking about. And then there's the slash sbin directory, which is kind of like the counterpart to the bin directory. It holds, again, executable programs, but the S here stands for system. So these are like, you know, system administration tools or, or programs that, that will be used by system administrators, whereas these are used by normal users, the stuff in, in the regular old bin directory. Okay, so, so what I want to do also is just go into the user directory real quick and show you one more thing. And like I said, we'll talk about all this later, you know, five or ten videos down the road. But I just want to give you a brief overview here. So there's also in the user directory, there's a bin directory and an sbin directory. So, so let's just put it this way. As a normal user, you're going to execute programs and they're going to be in one of two places. They're either going to be in slash bin or user slash bin. And then as a system administrator, the programs, most of the programs that you execute are going to be in slash sbin or slash user slash sbin. Okay, so the normal user stuff is in the bin and the system administrator stuff is in the sbin. And then, you know, it's either in slash or, or slash user depending on, on what it is. Okay, so, uh, you know, like I said, later on in the video series, we'll talk more about this whole directory structure. We'll explain, you know, the more details. But for right now, you need to know where these programs are located. And now what I want to do is show you uh, how to configure some stuff through user configuration files. Now what I want to do is go back and show you some user config files uh, and, and show you how to modify them to make your life a little bit easier for, for the moment. Uh, but when you modify your own user configuration files, you don't want to be the root user because that's going to mess up the permissions a little bit. So what you want to do is you want to be the, you know, you, you want to be logged into your own account when you're messing with your own configuration files. So you can see I'm still logged in as the root user because we did that su command. So what I'm going to do is type exit and that'll get me out of being the root user. Now you can see I'm back to being the peri user. And I'm also back in the directory that I was in when I typed the su command. Okay, so I'm back in the home peri directory. So I'm just going to clear the screen here to reduce the clutter a little bit. And I want to do uh, an ls minus a to show you uh, all the different user config files that are in here. And the ones that I want to talk about right now are a couple of the ones that start with dot bash. So first let me show you, all the things that have a tilde at the end here, these are all old versions of these files. The newest versions are the ones without the tilde, okay? But if you mess something up while you're editing it and you, you saved your changes by accident, you can usually go back and get the old version by, by you know, getting the one that has the tilde on the end, okay? So that's, that's one thing to note. Uh, I already told you that the .bash history file kept a track of all your previous commands so that you could cycle back through them with the arrow key. Uh, and then there's the bash profile and the bash rc file and these are like configurations for the bash shell. 
Now you might ask yourself, well, what's this bash shell that you're talking about? Well, the bash shell is what you're interacting with every time you type a command in this text mode interface. Okay? When I type ls minus a, the bash shell is taking that and running it and, and basically giving it to the operating system to run. It's your like intermediary between you and the operating system in, in some sense. Okay? So the bash profile, uh, the dot bash profile and the dot bash rc is where you can configure some properties of the bash shell. Now what I want to do is I want to go into the bash profile. You should vi it because I want you to edit something in there. And so we'll vi dot bash profile. And mine's already changed, but I'll just show you what, what you should have in there so that you can change it too. It's all about this path variable is what I want you to set right now. The path variable, or the, this is basically just like a preference uh, or some setting that you want to that you want to change. And the path variable, what it does is it tells the operating system where it should look for programs that you want to run. Okay, so uh, there's this path variable, and and what you should do is you should just type this sort of you know don't worry too much about what it means right now, but you say path equals dollar sign path colon slash user slash sbin colon slash sbin. So forget about this last part. You don't have to worry about that right now. Just type this beginning part. And what that's saying is to add the user sbin directory and the slash sbin directory to your path. Your path already contains uh, the slash bin directory and it already contains slash user slash bin. And that's the stuff for normal user usage. Okay? But as a system administrator, you're going to want to use uh, commands in these directories. And so you should add that to your path of your personal account and you should also add it to the path of the root user's account. Okay, so go become the root user, go into the root users dot bash profile in their home directory and, uh, and, and you know, alter the path the exact same way. Okay, so this, this line right here sets the path to be a new value. It tells the operating system that you might want to run commands in here, so it should look in there when, when you type a command name. And then export path, you know, makes that setting active in some sense. Okay, so this is what you should do here. And then once you make those changes, remember, you hit escape to go into the command mode. Uh, shift colon and then say WQ to write your changes and quit out of the VI editor. Okay, you do that and now your bash profile will be changed. All right, and now you'll have a new uh, profile. Typically you have to log out and log back in to do it. Another way that you can do it is just say uh, source dot bash profile. Okay, and that will make your changes active like right now. Okay, so by saying source uh, in, and the, the name of the configuration file, that will like, you know, run the configuration file. It's like you just logged in again and it, and, it, and it ran the configuration file. This stuff runs every time you start up a new shell, like bash profile and bash rc. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to show you about editing configuration files is just setting your path so that, you know, you don't run into problems later when we start doing system administration stuff. And now what I want to show you is how to uh, set an alias. Now I want to alter a separate user configuration file to set an alias. And I'll show you what an alias is in a second. Okay, so let's uh, mess with the uh, bash rc file this time. And if we go in there again with the vi editor, uh, you'll see it says in here user specific aliases and functions. That's where, you know, specific aliases go. And we know what an alias is in real life, right? It's like, you know, like an alternate identity or an assumed name or something like that. And that's what it is in the in the shell too. It's, it's a little bit different, but you'll see in a second. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some stuff here. So I'll hit, hit I to go into insert mode. Okay. And then uh, I'll go down here to the end. And what I'll do is I'll type alias. I'll put a space and then I'll say RM equals single quotes RM minus I with the space between RM and minus I. Okay. And then another single quote. Okay, so, so in some sense what I'm doing here is saying RM minus I is the assumed identity of RM. Every time I type RM at the command line, the operating system's really going to do RM minus I. And re remember, when I introduced RM to you, the minus I command just made it double check to, to make sure that you wanted to delete that file that you, that you specified. Okay? So this is going to do it all the time. You never have to put the minus I option on because every time you type RM now, it's really going to do RM minus I. Okay? So let's save this. We'll hit escape. So we go back to command mode, uh, shift colon, okay, and then WQ to write our changes and quit. And we'll do that. And now what we do is we'll do that source dot bash RC again. Okay, so this runs the bash RC program. And now let's do an LS here. Let me remove uh, temp2.txt with the RM command. 
Now notice I'm not using rm minus i, I'm just saying rm, so you know, it seems like it should just remove the file, right? But it's going to ask me, it's going to double check with me because I've got that alias now. So even though I just typed rm, it's really doing an rm minus i, it's inquiring and making sure that that's what I want to delete. If I really do want to delete it, I can say y, if I don't, I can say n, and, and you know, that, that way I get that double check without having to remember to type the minus i option. I just want to do a couple more things here before we wrap up this introduction. I talk a little bit more about directory names, okay? So here we are in the Perry directory and I do an ls and you can see I've got these subdirectories, okay? So we've already seen that to use the, you know, to go into one of those subdirectories I can just type cd hold for instance. And now that takes me into the hold directory. Okay, but, but what, the only reason this worked, this cd hold command, the only reason that worked is because I was already in the Perry directory. If I was up in like the slash bin directory and I said cd hold, that wouldn't work because there's no subdirectory of that directory called hold. Okay? So this is what we call a relative directory name. Uh, and, and you can spot a relative directory name because it doesn't start with a slash. Okay? And the contrast to relative directory names are absolute directory names and absolute directory names do start with a slash. Okay? So absolute directory names will work from anywhere in the system. A relative directory name depends on where you're at. So see, Perry, I'm in the Perry directory, so cd hold works perfectly well. Okay? Now let's change from the hold directory over to the scripts directory. All right? And I can do that uh, by saying cd dot dot. I could hit enter, and then I would be back in the Perry directory, and then I could say cd scripts as a separate command. Or I could do it all in one command by saying cd dot dot slash scripts. Okay? Now, the, the slash on the end is, is superfluous. That's not necessary, but when I did the tab completion, it just showed up. Okay? But, but if that's not there, it, w it would work just as well. It doesn't matter. Okay? But the point here is this does not start with a slash again, right? So this is a, a relative directory name. So it's saying go up one level, that's what the dot dot says, and then go down into the scripts directory. Again, this will only work from some directory that's like, you know, the C directory or the mail directory or the hold directory because it goes up one level to get to the Perry directory and then down into the scripts directory. So I do that and now I get down into the scripts directory, okay? So there's another example of a relative directory name. Let me give you an example of an absolute directory name. Say I want to go back to the hold directory again. So what I can do here to give an absolute directory name is you start with a slash and you just specify it right from the top. You say home slash Perry slash hold. Okay? And like I said, this is going to work from anywhere in the whole directory structure. It doesn't matter because you're specifying the name, you know, you're specifying the entire name, slash home, slash Perry, slash hold. That's the full name of that directory. And when I go in there, that's it. And if you do a PWD on that, you can see there's the full directory name and that's what I specified there. That's the absolute directory name. And like I said, that works from anywhere on the system. So I'm just trying to give you more of a, a sense here on how to move around in the system and, and you know, Typically we use relative directory names because we're moving from one directory to another, we're moving from one directory up to another or whatever, uh, but sometimes absolute directory names come in handy when you just want to move, you know, from somewhere in the system to somewhere completely different that has nothing to do with relatively to where you are now, okay? And, and that's how you would do it. You start with a slash and you specify the whole directory name out completely. All right, well, it's time to wrap up our second introduction to Linux nugget here. In this one, we talked about the man pages and the info pages, and I was really trying to impress upon you what a good resource this is for, you know, learning about the details of Linux, how commands work, what options are available for each command, that kind of stuff. Then we talked about the directory structure of Linux and how to specify directory names. And understanding this stuff is going to make your life a lot easier navigating around the system. And then we talked a little bit about user config files and I had you make a couple changes to your user config files. And, and you know, I hope you didn't feel like I left you hanging here because we're definitely going to talk about that stuff in more detail later once we have a, you know, more firm grounding in Linux. I was just trying to, you know, subvert some frustration that you might run into when we get to the administration tasks and that kind of stuff. Well, I hope you found this nugget informative and thanks again for viewing.